We're uh, doing this panel under the title Bolstering Cybersecurity Corporation uh, Across the Union. And I want to introduce you to our panelists. And we're going to do this in the same manner as we did earlier. I introduce the panelists, and you uh, applaud like crazy. And I know now that, now that you've been fed, I'm pretty sure that you will uh, master that even better than earlier, right? You want to try it first? Oh, come on. Yeah, that's not going to do it for me. Once again. Oh. Now I got so enthusiastic, I dropped my glasses. Here they are. Okay, so introducing the panel. Um, here is David Van Wiel, who's the Assistant Secretary General of NATO. Come up here, David. <laughs> yes, here, if you don't mind. Yes. And we have Marina Calderon, who's a member of European Parliament. Marina. <laughs> Nana Louise Wilfang Linde, Vice President of European Government Affairs at Microsoft. <laughs> Hazel Diaz, Global Head of Cyber GR, CNC South Central Services, Santander. And the session will be moderated by Director General at Digital Europe, Cecilia bonefeld Day. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stay up here because I am going to uh, take the questions that you guys uh, send us over Slido and raise my hand when I find it appropriate. So I hope you'll notice that, Cecilia. Okay, I promise to, um, to note you. <laughs> so um, I actually know a lot more about the people here. They are some of the best people in cyber that, uh, that I know. Uh, I worked with David in uh, NATO on designing the Diana on the EDTs, on the strategy on EDTs. And thank you for your great and innovative work uh, on cyber, but also on technologies in NATO. I am working with Marina uh, in the Global Cyber Aspen Group, and you've been involved as an Estonian and uh, as a politician in cyber for ages. I'm working with Nana Luisa, also at the board of Digital Europe, and of course with Microsoft being one of the companies really involved in cyber and in the war in Ukraine. And uh, last but absolutely not least, with Hazel on, uh, on our Digital Resilience Council that we shaped in Digital Europe. And, um, uh, as a representative for Santander, I think I can say that you are the number one in cybersecurity in the banking sector. So, uh, so thank you so much uh, for coming to stage uh, with me. Um, so, there's no doubt that, I mean, we've seen in, in Ukraine with, with the hybrid threats, everybody's talking about it. But I think there are at least a few things that has become extremely evident. Um, first, um, the borders between private and public sector are being very blurry when we need to solve common problems. And we need to find a governance model that is much more established. Uh, second of all, how do we make you know, better collaboration across different institutions in like, a more organized way? And I, I urge you, and I know that David read this all night yesterday, right? I urge you also to read this publication that we have just published, The Digital Frontline, uh, 15 Actions to Boost uh, Europe's Digital Resilience. So with that, let me, uh, let me start the, the panel and, uh, and let me turn to, um, to some of the, the questions that we should tackle here today and say, um, looking at uh, maybe starting with you, Nana Louise, I mean, Microsoft have played a major role in Ukraine uh, in many of the cyber attacks in solving those problems. You can predict it, you can see it in your systems before it even happens. What's the role in private sector in this? Um, I think the role of private sector is to contribute what we can contribute with uh, and collaborate with, with, with governments to achieve the outcome that we all want. Um, <clears throat> We, uh, as Microsoft, monitor um, cyber attacks and uh, criminal acti activities to protect our customers. So there we have some information and some uh, intelligence that governments don't have. So what we did in Ukraine is that we provided all that information and um, even before the war started, we could see increased activities. Uh, and we've worked very closely with the Ukrainian government to give them that information. 
another role that we played was to, uh, you know, all their, uh, the data in the country was on servers uh, in the country. So in, uh, they were vulnerable both to physical attacks and also to cyber attacks, because if they are on, on servers in the country, they are more vulnerable to cyber attacks than if they are in the cloud in a secure data center. So we migrated their data, uh, and other tech companies did that as well, in very, very short time to, to, to put them to, to secure place outside of the country. Um, I think, if, you know, in order to do our job even better, um, if there is more information sharing also from the government side to us, then we can be more efficient and, and know better what the need is and where the gaps are. Um, I just had, had a talk today with, with, uh, with, with, with somebody I know from the Commission, and she said they're actually working on going more to that, uh, that model uh, the, that's very efficient in the U.S., the collaboration with, with, uh, with us and the government. And uh, it's also working really good in Ukraine because we have this urgent situation and obvious need. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, if we work together, we can achieve much more. So maybe, Marina, turning to you, you've been working with cyber, you've been through all the attacks in Estonia, seeing how bad it can really go, and, uh, you know, I know that, that Estonia has made different measures, uh, data embassies, and maybe you can elaborate a bit on that, but why is there still this artificial divide between private and public sector? We're hearing that private sector actually hosts the data and, or the information they want to share, but sometimes they can't share, and sometimes they, they don't get a response. So wh wh what, what's, what's stopping us from taking the ne next step? <coughs> First of all, thank you very much for having me on this panel. It's a real pleasure. And I have to start with a confession that in the European Parliament I'm doing much more privacy than security anymore, but security, cybersecurity is very close to my heart. So yes, I was a student ambassador in Russia in 2007 during the cyber attacks when I had to learn in 15 minutes what do DDoS attacks mean, and since then, yes, I've been involved. It's a very good question, and you know that I'm a strong supporter of multi-stakeholderism, I'm a very strong, strong supporter of inclusiveness, because for the first time in the history of mankind, government alone can't meet the challenges of cyber world. They have to cooperate with other stakeholders. On political level, everything is perfect. Look at the statements. Organizations making statements, governments making statements, how important is private sector, how important it is to work with industry, academia, uh, civil society. But when we come to the practical terms, there, are some, there is somehow resistance. Uh, I've been in government, so I understand that it's not in the DNA of government to cooperate with industry, and it's still not there. It's not the political level, but the real cooperation starts when governments understand that they really can't be efficient without private sector. For my country, it was 2007, when private sector came to assist government. And for my country, it has been a very clear political decision not to, uh, not to, edu <laughs> not, not to raise the same level of uh, service providers, but rather invest in private sector as online service providers and to treat private sector as a partner, reliable partner, concerning exchange of information. And that's why the Estonian Cyber Defense League, it really works. It's a private sector component from, from lawyers to military to teachers, whomever. The IT geeks whom government can never afford because they're so expensive, they go to Microsoft. <laughs> but we can engage with them voluntarily when they see that government wants to cooperate with them and is cooperating with them. So I really do hope that EU and NATO will make the change and really will start listening. No, my last remark, and then I, I promise I, I'll be really short. In the European Parliament, I'm working with the Cyber Resilience Act. I talk to Commission, makes sense. I talk to industry, makes sense. But how come they do not make sense together? What's there in between? Uh, I'm not an IT geek myself, I'm not an IT person myself, so for me it's very difficult to understand all the, understand all the te technological nuances. 
But I think that it's time to come together and to find the solutions together. Because, uh, and you need smart politicians. In the European Parliament, I see that if you want to have good laws, you have to educate politicians you know, on the European Parliament level, but also on the national level. Mm. So I, I am optimistic, but I'm not happy with the situation <laughs> as it is at the moment. Well, maybe I should also ask myself, maybe we need to drive some kind of educational pro uh, program for, for politicians. Policy. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. No, Absolutely. Serious, huh? Absolutely. We actually uh, talked about it. So maybe it's time for us to step up. Yeah. So uh, turning to you, David. So, I mean, following Ukraine, uh, we have seen a much more visible NATO on not only cyber, but also EDTs. Um, what is the alliance doing for uh, cybersecurity? And is there anything that we can, that EU can benefit from uh, NATO's now new uh, cyber uh, defense pledge? Yeah, thank you for the question. First of all, thank you for having me on this panel as a man on international women. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not I mean, upsetting really the gender <laughs> balance here, uh, uh, but I'm happy to be, uh, to be part of this panel. Um, uh, the war in Ukraine at first sight really looks like a very traditional war. Uh, with tanks, with trenches, with artillery uh, uh, shellings, etc. And, and there were people that came up to me uh, as I'm not dealing with those traditional threats and said, well, you can close your shop because we're back to the Second World War now. Mm. Uh, but if you look closely, that is not at all true. Uh, we already heard from Microsoft what happened in the cyber domain. We saw the Russians using cyber to prepare the war. We saw the Russians using cyber as they started the war, as they physically attacked locations. They also, in cyber, attacked those same locations. Uh, they succeeded as well, to a certain extent. Uh, look at how necessary Starlink has been since the beginning of this war in keeping up communications in, in, in Ukraine. Um, we're seeing AI being used in translating intercepted Russian calls. Uh, we see the use of uh, 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 drones uh, uh, powered by uh, 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 powerful software that are really making a difference on the battlefield. So innovation uh, is really in this war. It is an integral part, and although you don't see it in all the pictures, uh, uh, it, it is definitely there. <coughs> so what are we learning from this after one year in Ukraine? Uh, well, let me start with the private sector. We need the private sector. Uh, and we don't only need the private sector uh, 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 when the crisis is there, uh, but we need to cement those ties before the crisis is there uh, and make use of the expertise, the knowledge, build the relationships so that when the crisis is there, we know what to do, we know who to call uh, <laughs> and we know where to turn to. Uh, as was already said by the previous speakers, it is unthinkable that we will be able to outmatch uh, the capabilities that you have, uh, and we don't need to because we're not Microsoft. Uh, uh, we're dealing in, in peace and security. Uh, so that's our expertise, what we bring to the table. Uh, so that's one of the lessons we learned. And we're looking into at NATO how we can have this collaboration with the private sector on a permanent basis, uh, sharing information uh, about what's happening uh, so that we can actually act on it uh, uh, as it happens. The second part is resilience. Uh, Ukraine has been doing great, uh, in part because they've been preparing for this war for eight years now. Mm. Uh, and they've been doing so in cyberspace as well. So apart from having their data stored in, in service in their country, which fortunately, thanks to your help, uh, was mitigated uh, before the attacks, but we've been training them for a long, long time in mitigating attacks, in making sure they have backups of all their systems. Uh, and that is showing now. And I would argue that Ukraine was probably better prepared for that than most of our nations are mm. right now. Mm. Uh, and the third part that this war shows is that uh, war is not something that the military does uh, and the rest of society continues living. Uh, war is something that affects everything. If you have a company designing websites in Ukraine, that is not what you are doing now. Mm. Uh, you are harnessing that knowledge and whatever you can contribute, uh, to the effort of uh, protecting your country's networks, uh, uh, hacking Russians, uh, and actually uh, uh, increasing the capabilities of your military. So how do we prepare ourselves in our societies for something that hopefully never happens, but if it does, cannot be dealt with alone by NATO or by troops, uh, mm. but needs all of you to, to mm. keep us uh, going. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I have to say, Ukraine is doing a fantastic job there. So we have a great example to learn from uh, and uh, we will stand behind them as long as it needs.
I Thank think you, you so made much. a very important point. You know, very few people know that there's two wars going on, the conventional war and the cyber war, and then the disinformation war as well, because there's a third element. Mm. Yeah, true, definitely true. Um, the hybrid threats uh, also comprise of the, of the misinformation. Uh, so maybe turning to you, Hazel. So I visited uh, Banca di Santander in, uh, in, uh, in Madrid. I visited your cyber center. I was super impressed. <laughs> And, uh, and there is a reason to be that because, I mean, uh, you stand out, but there, the banking sector is maybe also one of the most cyber resilient sectors. You, ca you have all the money and therefore you also need to protect it and you are very, <laughs> a very digital sector. So, so um, Thank you. I mean, what is it? I mean, what can we learn and how? I mean, we are, everybody's speaking about the competences and how do we get the right certifications. And, do you already in the banking sector have something that we can lean upon, something that we can kind of use and, and take and, and get a common ground for, for skills and certifications? Yes, I think that in the, in the cybersecurity industry as a whole, we have been suffering a, a talent shortage for a long time. So in the banking sector, I think that as a maybe more mature uh, uh, sector, we have been dealing with that for the last several years. So, uh, and actually this challenging threat landscape, it's not making that any, any better at all. So we need much more resources. So the, well, the, the, there is a, a research that said that we will need by 2025, like three million cybersecurity professionals globally. So it's huge. So uh, I don't think that in the banking sector we have the magic uh, formula for that, but there are three, uh, two main areas that we have been working seriously so in the last year. So the first one is collaboration with universities. For us, it's crucial to make the cybersecurity profession uh, more popular, to make them understand to the town people. So cybersecurity is seen like a, a Techy profession. So, and uh, we need a wide range of skills. We need journalists. We need lawyers. We need good communication skills. So, and the young people don't doesn't know anything about that. They just think that the sexy thing of being a hacker. So, we have spent a lot of time through uh, the network we have with universities on training uh, the university, the, the, the people to provide and to uh, arrange hackathons and this type of exercises to, to make cybersecurity as, a, uh, as a, an attractive profession and also in as a ba the banking sector as an attractive sector, because for a cybersecurity specialist, the banking sector at the, fin at the first chance is, is not attractive. They don't think it's the actual sexy work that they would like to have as a big tech, as Microsoft, for example. So then we have put a lot of effort in training, explaining, and to arranging competitions amongst them to find good talent and recruit them. So th there is a second point is, building cybersecurity careers, because it's not only attracting people, it's retaining people. So the cybersecurity talent, uh, talent challenge, I would say, is to retain and develop the people. So cybersecurity is not a sectorial competition. So we are competing with Microsoft, with Apple, with all the, the, the range of sectors. So we need to make ourselves attractive providing a good cybersecurity career. So we, we need to define jobs descriptions. We need to, to explain our, uh, our, uh, our people what are the different ways and the different careers they will need to pursue and helping them to follow their, uh, to develop themselves. So I think it's uh, two key areas that we in the banking sector have been working heavily in Santander. Uh, and, and of course, I think there is here another opportunity for a public and private partnership and collaboration. So, uh, as you have said, so we need to understand, and we know to uh, understand the complexity uh, of all the sectors. So, if we facilitate that the people, the, the, the cybersecurity professionals uh, have access to a public roles more in a more easy way, and the other way around. So, I think it will help to upskill the cybersecurity community as a whole. So I think that there are initiatives here that I think that the private sector can collaborate with the public sector as well to improve the skill talent. 
Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, I mean, looking a little bit at the private-public collaboration, one of the things that NATO has done is really looking at the Diana, the, the whole EDTs, not only cybersecurity. What is it that you have done? What is the mechanism that kind of brings you closer to the private sector there? Well, first of all, we, we established that there is a gap between us and the private sector. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, but one of them is that we are very complex bureaucracies. So if you want to do business with NATO, the average procurement procedure takes 16.2 years. Uh, I, I can hear you laughing now. You, you're not laughing if you want a contract. Uh, you'll, you'll be losing your company before you get any. You, you said 16, right? 16.2 years, yeah. Okay. That's great if you're Lockheed Martin and you're building fighter jets and you know you have fixed customers. Uh, but it's not that good if you're a startup with a great new innovative technology or working in the cyber domain or selling software. Uh, for selling software is already difficult to government organizations uh, because we like to buy boxes, uh, but not necessarily code. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there in our procedures. There's also a challenge that where once upon a time defense was the origin of innovation uh, with things like GPS, the internet itself, uh, Velcro, uh, you name it, but it came out of military inventions that then went into pr uh, the private sector. It's completely the other way around now. So innovation is owned by the private sector uh, and we have to make it attractive to work with us. So Diana, as you mentioned, is our um, uh, 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 wormhole, so to speak, into a different world uh, where we will actually connect to innovators, to startups, uh, to new companies, uh, we get them interested in our challenges uh, and we will help them grow their dual-use companies. And I say dual-use uh, because we are very much uh, uh, of the conviction that uh, we shouldn't create the new uh, uh, one-trick uh, companies that only work with defense uh, because innovation happens uh, in the commercial sector. So to keep vibrant companies uh, that can also help us, that is the aim of Diana. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So SMEs, you will see like hundreds of SMEs having contracts and uh, collaborations with, uh, with NATO. So, so my aim is to go from 16.2 years to 16.2 days when it comes down to contracts. Yeah, that's <laughs> the goal. That you yeah. can keep me to that I, in two years' time. So, do you, and uh, so let's see if, uh, if, uh, if, you, if EU can keep up, right? And the government's in the room. So, uh, so Marina, if you, look at, uh, if you look at the EU, the EU has now launched a new cyber defense policy. Do you think it's enough to address it? I mean, uh, what's the good elements in there? What could you wish for more? <coughs> First of all, I'd like to uh, react uh, on what David said. Uh, you mentioned that NATO has to be interesting to the private sector. I would say that you are already interesting. I would say that there is an outcry from the private sector to cooperate with governments, to cooperate with organizations, and unfortunately, it's great if you can change from 16 years to 16 days. No, not realistic. At least do it one year. It's already a big thing. But I think that governments and organizations are today lagging behind because industry wants cooperation. They are interested. They are committed. They are devoted. They have skills and we're not answering enough. Now, Can I just no. interact yeah. on, on yeah, yeah. one point? One, little over one year ago, before the war in Ukraine started, um, working for defense was being put in the same taxonomy as pornography and tobacco <laughs> uh, here in, in the EU. Uh, so companies that were working for defense could not get bank accounts. Uh, so I agree that a lot has changed since the 24th of February, but we've been very, very uh, unfriendly uh, towards actually getting access to this talent, also to work for uh, 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 organizations like, like NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm glad we're turning the tide, uh, but it, it was high time. Uh, coming to the EU, uh, well, first of all, I think that the, uh, real, the digital agenda is really ambitious, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Uh, the Commission and the Parliament has one year to go. So I think that this year will be crucial to complete, to, to complete the files that are on the table. Where I see the role of the EU, uh, for the first time it was with the GDPR, where I would say EU became a global leader, a global example. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was lots of criticism coming from some third countries, including United States, including US companies, but in the end, they adopted GDPR, as much as we can say, there are questions with implementation, I, I know that, but in principle, they adopted. Uh, 
they, uh, they are now asking their own government to do something of the same kind of national level. So I see that EU can be a global uh, example setter. And the same, as I mentioned, with the Cyber Resilience Act. We need it. And with that also, we can be glo a global example, with global leaders, others to follow. Uh, I also see that with data privacy, which is today very close to my heart, when we conclude, uh, uh, or let's say the Commission is looking into adequacy decisions of exchange of private data with third countries, UK, US, we can there ask for better standards, for better protection of our own citizens. So EU has a crucial role. And I really do hope that we will not lose it. And also internationally. Mm. Uh, I'm not naive. I know how uh, uh, politically and ideologically divided UN is today. I don't think that we will be able to uh, have anything legally binding in the United Nations with the present situation. I just learned that uh, Russia proposed another code of conduct which is not right, which is not democratic, and which will not be accepted by like-minded countries. So the division is there. And even more, we have to work regionally. I remember when I was foreign minister 2015, we were discussing, uh, I was sitting at the EU table as a foreign minister, I was sitting at the NATO table as a foreign minister. And it was like two different organizations. The same people, different talking points. We have to overcome that. We have to start speaking the same digital language, the same cooperation, exchange of information, participation in different uh, exercises. We have to start cooperating, uh, okay. EU and NATO much better. Thank you so much. And that's a commitment, right? So with that, let's, let's uh, close the dialogue there with that commitment. <laughs> and then uh, I think we have some questions, but then I want to jump do. back. We Can do. I just make one comment also to this yes, yes, uh, before we close it Please. completely? Yeah. <laughs> NATO is just a key partner to European governments in European resilience. And I think any discussions we have in Europe about European cybersecurity and resilience has, cannot be done in isolation of the same discussion in NATO. Hmm. I think that's really important. And, and it's that. nice to... So now we can lose it. <laughs> and there is a commitment, and we've seen that from both yeah. parties. Huh? Yeah. So uh, yeah. we applaud that. Um, There's yes. some interest in uh, the role of civil society. Two different questions yeah? are uh, somewhat uh, related. Uh, someone is asking, uh, I think this is Lily. We're talking a lot about public-private collaboration when speaking about multi-stakeholderism. What's the place of civil society and mm -hmm. organizations there? And the second one, what's your position on the adoption of the multi-stakeholder approach that would actively involve the technical society and civil society? I think that's a very good question. And, and Hazel, I, I mean, I think you touched upon it, right? <laughs> All the things you actually do on education uh, to make it a profession and to involve. Do you want to elaborate on that? I'm happy to also tap in. Yes, uh, absolutely. So I think that we need to generate this value and trust to the society in general. So we, uh, from the private sector, I think that we have the mandate to help our society in different ways. Training and awareness is one of them. So we need to train our society on how feel how feel confidence when they, uh, they, they interact with us in the, using the digital channels. So it, it's, we, we, cannot, we cannot assume that they are all cybersecurity experts. So we need to train them. So this is my new way of working, so my new way of interaction. So it's my obligation to train them and to give you the tools. So I'm, I'm not only totally being in a proactive way, but I need to be there when they have a problem. Yeah. So it's very important that they, have, they know how to contact me when they feel that their the credentials have been compromised or they feel that they have entered their their car data into a fraudulent website. So it's very important that we help them in these situations as well. Mm. So uh, for, for us, it's very important these two parts of the, of, of the coin. So it's training and awareness, but as well being there when they have a problem. Yeah. And maybe just also uh, answering the same uh, question. I mean, Digital Europe is basically looking at building a um, uh, a network of cyber campuses. Uh, there's already one in France, and we are looking at if we can follow the SOCs 
uh, around in, the, in, in Europe, uh, basically building competence centers with education, with access to private sector competences. And well, you know, uh, we are looking for partners. So of course, a public par uh, private partnership, but also really for civil society to have the right education. And we are basically pushing a digital curricula uh, already in primary schools uh, for both cybersecurity skills, for coding skills, etc. So definitely something that, that, that we will see as a major part on civil society uh, and how to make a, re a resilient society. Uh, do you have another question or can I move on? You can move on. I can move on, thank you. So uh, maybe asking uh, you, Nana, uh, now we're talking a lot about what can NATO, they can go from like 16 years to 16 days, you know, EU has to collaborate more with, uh, with NATO and amongst the member states and all this. What can we, I mean, how can Microsoft be more efficient? How, what can we do and what can your company do to be more efficient and help the process? <clears throat> I think I touched upon it a little bit before that, uh, you know, we are more than happy to, to help. And I think, you know, cyber security is a global, global talk, even for Europe. You know, it's, it's not something we can keep within the borders. Uh, so I think there's a role for, for NATO, for Microsoft, for countries that are companies that are, uh, you know, willing to help. Um, I think, more, like I said before, more information the other way. And of course, that, that, that means that you need to trust each other. Mm. <laughs> so that's very important. Um, another area, and it's a little bit what we just talked about, is uh, I think what we, where we can also help is uh, in the skills mm. uh, area. Um, a recent LinkedIn uh, survey showed that there is a increase of 22% demand for people with cyber security skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have our own program uh, that we roll out in collaboration with uh, NGOs and governments and, um, and uh, in, in, in institu education institutions. And I know that EU also has their cybersecurity academy. Um, but I think we should really that's really another area where we can help, I think, because we have a lot of expertise and we can help train with our programs. So um, let me take one more question from the audience and then I have a question for all of you at the end. Please, Midi. Right. Um, there's actually uh, two different ones, but I'll, I'll start That's with the latter. The panel <laughs> stated that GDPR uh, is, an, is an example where others, for example, the U.S., have learned from us. Where can we learn from others that could, for example, be uh, U.S. defense procurement? Okay, very interesting. Anybody wants to tell where we can learn something from? I think the public part, uh, private partnership between uh, on, uh, in, in this area in cyber defense, uh, we can learn from the US. Mm -hmm. a very close collaboration there, if, if that answers the, the question. The ISAC on banking, I think the yeah. ISAC. Yeah, the FSI SAC is one of the examples. So I think it has been a proven success and with uh, during the Ukraine war uh, so we have seen actually the benefit of having this trusted network in, in order to share information and to uh, and to collaborate against uh, the same actor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and another area of collaboration is not really with cyber security but uh, for example in Ukraine uh, we are helping the International Court of Justice to collect um, proof of war crime with our AI technology, so that when the war is over, we have the mm. uh, evidence to... Hmm. So anywhere on I cyber that we can yeah, learn? I, I will add one thing. We have to learn how to be competitive and not to over-regulate. Mm. <laughs> because unfortunately, I see that uh, startups who start in Europe end up in Silicon Valley. I want them to end up in, I don't know, in Madrid, in Brussels, wherever, but they prefer to go there because there is less bureaucracy. I'm not saying that we do not need regulation at all, but we in the EU, we just love to regulate. But we have to regulate to a certain extent and not to over-regulate. I'm glad yeah. you said it. <laughs> yeah, no, can, can, yes, I, can I just completely uh, echo that? I was on a panel a few weeks ago where somebody said uh, the EU is maybe too quick to regulate and the US may be too late. Uh, so maybe there's a sweet spot in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe one last question um, to uh, David and to Marina. Do you see in the future kind of an established uh, information, cyber information sharing and defense structure 
uh, between uh, multiple stakeholders like the private, the public sector, uh, and of course your organization, so EU and, and, and NATO. Do you, do you see that happening? Yes. Uh, in, in NATO, we're working on a construct like that. Uh, so as I said, we do want to have more permanent uh, uh, dialogue with the private sector. Uh, and we're also looking at this from a experience <coughs> point of view. Um, so I think in cyberspace, most companies are now aware that they need to have a zero trust attitude. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that doesn't only go for uh, uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, that is basically for every company uh, needs to adhere to this, this mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, what we can do, we're in the business of uh, 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 people that have bad intentions, uh, and we can help uh, in uh, educating people about what those bad intentions might be. Uh, and that's the kind of dialogues uh, what we can bring to the table, let's put it that way. Well, I can't speak on behalf of the EU. There are people can who can speak <laughs> on behalf of the EU. I can speak on behalf of the European Parliament. Yes, I would argue that we need something permanent. To, to, to permanent council or permanent something. And I know that you gave, you, you have an initiative, you have a point how to start the better cooperation. So yes, I'm looking for that. But as I said, I'm not in a position to say anything on behalf of the EU. As the member of parliament, I'm constantly, constantly, constantly talking to all the multi-stakeholders, including civil society, academia and industry. Thank you so much. I think we have uh, to end on that almost almost committing that uh, we will try to work, at least from Digital Europe, we are already working on a more established structure. We have now shaped our uh, uh, Digital Resilience Council and um, we definitely have a commitment both to education and for skills and to work with the public, pri uh, pu uh, pu public private partnerships. Thank you so much for your uh, great interventions. Let's give them a hand. Thank you.